Morning Show. On to the Heritage Pork Rind Festival over in Herod. We're talking to Brian Archer this morning. Every town has its storyteller. Telling Lima's story has become Mill's life's work. I had a buddy in college. His name was Ed. And Ed was a football star in his youth. And uh, he used to talk about it all the time. And he, he didn't really quite cut it college level, but he still talked about it. And one day, about junior, senior year in college, came to the realization that nobody cared anymore. He was, he was living in the past. And that's what we've done to a point as a city. We got hung up in our star days. For Lima, the star days began with oil. In 1885, a man named Benjamin C. Farot went drilling for natural gas to power his paper mill. He struck black gold instead. A year later, John D. Rockefeller bought 150 acres of navy bean fields and founded the solar refinery, later known as Standard Oil of Ohio. For the next decade, Lima reigned as the oil capital of the world, with production at 24 million barrels by 1904. Even after local drilling ceased in 1910, the refinery remained a powerhouse, processing crude piped in from newer fields. Within that time, Lima changed from a quiet farming community to a boom town. Population surged from 16,000 in 1890 to 30,500 in 1910. Private homes became boarding houses for workers. West Market Street became the Golden Block, named for its grand mansions. Downtown boasted new hotels, stores, restaurants, and the stately Farot Opera House and Music Hall, which drew celebrity performers and elegant audiences. led to the growth of Lima's second glorious industry, trains. By the early 1900s, the town had become a railroad hub. Well, for years, there were five class one railroads that served this community. And then there were two major electric railroad systems in addition to the steam lines. And John Keller should know, he became an expert on the lore of Lima's railroads. People may smile when he conducts what locals call his morning worship in the park, but no one doubts his knowledge. He can talk about the best of times in Lima. More than 60% of the employed people in this community work for a steam or an electric railroad or a union tank car company or Lima Locomotive Works. The Loco Works was the largest producer of trains in the United States. Its Shea engines and A1 superpower steam locomotives made Lima famous worldwide. With oil and trains as its backbone, the town's economy grew. From the Graham Bernstein Motor Truck Company came Liberty Trucks, nationally renowned during World War I. From the Lima Depot came tanks. Superior Coach Company produced buses, ambulances, and hearses. Successful smaller businesses lent diversity. The Diesel Wemmer Cigar Company rolled out two million stogies monthly, becoming one of the largest cigar manufacturers in the country by 1920. The town's 20 neon shops made signs and theater marquees. But Lima boomed at a cost. On mornings in the wintertime, when there was a blanket of smoke enveloping this city, one didn't realize that it was a sunshiny day until the train he was working on got a few miles out of town. And prosperity brought some unsavory elements into Lima. Prostitutes, gambling, gangsters. Enough vice to earn Lima the nickname Little Chicago. The town was also a hotbed of union activity and radical politics. Lima was one of more than 20 Ohio cities that elected a socialist mayor in 1911. At one time, John Keller, a lifelong activist, ran for governor on the socialist ticket. Money. The post-war slowdown affected the entire town. Demand for defense products dropped. 
Diesel-powered trains replace steam locomotives, forcing the local works to halt production in 1951. The nation lost its taste for Lima cigars, and neon went out of vogue. Still, the town economy held steady through the mid-1970s thanks to its industrial base. The steel foundry remained productive. The Lima Ordnance Depot still rolled out tanks. Clark Equipment made cranes on the site of the old loco works. Ford Motor Company produced engines. And of course, there was oil. The refinery prospered, and Standard Oil of Ohio, or Sohio as it was then known, expanded to include a chemical plant. But then Lima began to experience the economic crunch already hitting other Rust Belt towns. Economist Ned Hill of Cleveland State University. So it all started to come down during the early 70s. Inflation started to pick up, and pick up quite substantially. And the core products that define the U.S. economy, cars, autos, steel, rubber, glass, all thought they didn't have any competitors and they could pass these wage cost increases onto their customers. And so the end result was consumer goods, expensive ones, shot up. And that essentially raised the barrier so high in terms of cost and quality that foreign goods said it's worthwhile to vault the barrier, jump across the oceans. So those local economies that were dominated by those heavy industries essentially came down like a house of cards very quickly. And those were the forces that hit Lima too. Superior Coach Company, once the country's largest producer of buses, closed in 1979, taking 2,000 jobs. In 1981, Clark Equipment shut down. In its heyday, it had employed 4,000. It meant by the mid-1980s, Lima had lost 6,000 industrial jobs. A town that at one time had seemed insulated against economic disaster saw its foundation crack. All the news crews, whenever they'd happen to mention us, would always call us a depressed industrial community. So I sort of grew up assuming that everybody was feeling sort of bad <laughs> because we were, we were depressed. You know. At the same time the community was losing industrial jobs, it was losing downtown. As it did across the country, the mall came to Lima and took Main Street business with it. People migrated to the suburban strips leaving great sections of the city abandoned. Crime rose in the decaying South End, and racial tensions continued to split. Berger had his work cut out for him. For a long time, it seemed like the bad news just kept coming. Plant closures, issues relating to crime, issues relating to neighborhood deterioration, economic development, all of that just seemed like when it rained, it poured. There was a new onslaught of layoffs for Lima at the end of the Cold War as the defense industry died. General Dynamics tank plant laid off hundreds in 1991. Airfoil Textron, which made fan blades for jet engines, closed in 1995, taking 1,800 jobs. 400 more jobs left with Sunstrand Electronics. In all, Lima lost 8,000 jobs by the mid-1990s, this on top of the 6,000 loss the previous decade. Population dropped from 52,000 in the early 70s to the current 45,000. We had layoffs in the city, reduced policemen, uh, laid off firemen, I laid off my secretary. I think the overall community mood was pretty sour. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jeff Fitzgerald. And Nightly newscasts reflected that feeling. Yeah, it sucks. We've done what they asked us to do, and then they still took away our livelihood. And sadly, that had been happening all too often in Lima. <laughs> 